Thank you, Glenda. Mirror my God to thee. Let that be so. Amen. A special welcome to you to the Hampton United Methodist Church worship service. To you here and for those of you who are joining us with KLMJ Radio and those on Facebook. For God is good. All the time. Let's sing together. Something good is about to happen. I just feel like something good is about to happen. I just feel like something good is on its way. He has promised that he'd open all of heaven. And brother, it should happen any day. When God's people humble themselves to call on Jesus, and they look to heaven expecting as they pray, I just feel like something good is about to happen. And brother, this could be that very day. Please join me. The preacher ever got up here. Oh, wait a minute. You already started, didn't you? Sorry, Robbie. (laughs) It's good to be here, folks. I just wanted to say, did you say something about the Lenten secret prayer? I did not. You did not. You were here. You didn't notice that I didn't say it? I I was running around the (laughs) church, you know, getting my exercise in so I could keep my slim and trim form. Huh. Anyway, if you signed up for the secret prayer partner uh, during Lent and put your name in one of the pails, they've all been put in this pail over here. So this morning, stop and pull out a name and uh, pray for that person. And if everything goes well during Lent, you can let them know (laughs) that you were praying for them. If it didn't go well for them during Lent, you might tell them that it would have been worse had you not been praying for them. (laughs) But I think now we need a call to worship. All right, please join me. The Lord reigns, let the nations tremble. He sits enthroned between the cherubim. Let the earth shake. Great is the Lord in Zion. He is exalted over all the nations. Let them praise your great and awesome name. He is holy. Let us praise his holy name. And let's sing How Great Thou Art, number 77.
You may be seated. Somebody asked me just before church about the finance committee. Is it on Tuesday or Wednesday? And I said it's on Tuesday, even though I sent out in the email that it's on Wednesday. And then I said, you know, you're supposed to know what I mean and not what I say or write. But the finance committee does meet on Tuesday at 630. Our scripture reading comes from Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 through 31 from the New International Version. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. This is God's word for God's people. Thanks be to God. And before we uh, lead into the prayer hymn and that, as you know, everybody knows, (laughs) during January, our boilers broke down. And uh, so... They were fixed, at least temporarily, and we're not sure how long they are going to last. And so at the last leadership council meeting, uh, the trustees were charged with looking into new boilers and how much they would cost and what we need to do. And so they have done so, and you'll hear a lot more about that in the days ahead. But... I've been asked by several people, does that mean that we're not putting in the parking lot this summer? And I said, no, we've already signed a contract for the parking lot. If those people who signed a commitment, a pledge, uh, to pay their pledge by the end of June, which is the timing that we set, we have the money set aside to pay for the parking lot. So that's already done. Something that we haven't advertised is before the parking lot, we signed a contract to have the caps uh, painted out in the front of the building and some minor tuck uh, tuck pointing done there. We have signed the contract before that for, for that to be done. And after the trustee meeting the other night, we think we have all the money for that. So that just leaves the the normal budget and the boilers, which, as I said, um, all the plans haven't been worked out, but you will hear about that. The other two projects, of course, are going to go on because we've signed the contract for them. And as I pray, I hope that we'll be in prayer for all of those um, who were uh, in any way affected by the tornadoes that uh, came through Iowa. Let's sing together, Majesty, worship, worship His Majesty, number 176.
Almighty God, this day we come to worship. You alone are worthy of all of our worship and adoration. We come because you're the creator. You made all things, including us. We come because you are the sustainer of life. Without you, all life would cease. We glorify your holy name this day. We come, O oh Lord, to hear, to hear your message this day. Come by your Spirit and speak to each of us. And we are so thankful that you invite us to come and to bring our prayers, our praise, our petitions before you. And so as we come this day, we do pray for all of those who were affected in any way by the storms, those who have lost loved ones. We just pray, O oh Lord, be with them. Strengthen them. We pray for those that we didn't name this day, but we carry on our hearts. Some are suffering from illnesses, and we pray for healing and wholeness. Others are, are grieving, and we pray for the comfort of your Holy Spirit. And some are just struggling with life. Be with them, O oh God. Bless them and guide them. We pray for our world, and we would pray, O oh Lord, for peace. We pray, be with the leaders of our world. Show them the way. We ask all of these things in the name of Jesus, the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's sing again. Majesty, worship his majesty. Majesty. We continue our worship as the choir sings in this very room.
let's continue our worship as we sing together hymn number 62, All Creatures of Our God and King. Six and seven. Get tired? Yeah, they're up they there. They have to pull out their hymnals, though, if they're going to do that. Because it's not on the screen, right, Larry? Well, if there were 37 of oh, them, we'd sing oh, them, right? Okay. Let's go.
You may be seated. The truth of the matter is the pastor just was off in his own little world, didn't know where he was, and I thought I had plenty of time to get back. So, well, this is it. We began a series of sermons based on scriptures that our confirmands have chosen. After all of the challenges of last year when the man seemed to select just one verse of scripture and expect me to come up with a sermon from that one. You'd think that I'd learn my lesson. Not to mention that they pick all the hymns. That is, if I can find the hymns that they choose. And uh, there was just one today that I couldn't find, so I inserted the prayer hymn that we used last time. You'd think I would have learned my lesson, but I guess I'm just a glutton for punishment. Or else, maybe I just don't have enough challenges in my life, and I needed one more this year. In any case, today's scripture and hymns were selected by Nicholas Quasdorf. And the first challenge was to figure out what scripture he had chosen. He wrote it down in such a way, I didn't know if he meant Genesis 31.1 or Genesis 1.31. But that was an easy challenge, because all I had to do was ask him. And we all know how shy and reserved Nick is. Always hesitant to speak his mind. And if you believe those last two sentences, you've never met Nick. Or any one of the other Quasdors that I know, but that's another point. I'm outnumbered this morning here because there's more of them than there is of me. But in any case, Nick looked at both of the scriptures and said Genesis 1.31 because it says that God saw that everything he made was very good. And that includes people. And I think, I didn't write it down, but I think Nick said that also includes him. Let us pray. We thank you, Lord, for all of creation and for the life you've given us. Come, Holy Spirit, and open your word to us while opening us body, mind, and spirit to your word. Give us the grace to hear your word and the love to let all other words sift away. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, okay. Nick gave us a jumping off place. Everything God created was very good. But it didn't give us any context. And so I went back to try to find the beginning of that thought that's found in Genesis 1.31. And as you're aware, I'm sure, in the original there are no chapters and verses. They're lucky if there are paragraphs found anywhere. Many of them were just written to just go on and on and on, kind of like my sermons. No, that's not in there. Anyway, I went back to verse 27. And as I looked at that verse, I began to look at commentaries and other sources to try to figure out what in the world I was going to say this morning. And I discovered that verse 27 is the very first use of poetry in the Old Testament and that 40% of the Old Testament is poetry. That's probably only interesting if you're an English teacher or a poet. So I searched elsewhere and discovered that, well, verse 27 obviously included the word created three times. Again, not very interesting. That is until you begin to look at biblical numerology. In the Bible, numbers mean something besides just what number it is. Each number has a specific root and therefore a specific meaning behind it. 
The number three is one of the numbers of God. And it's also the number of completion and perfection. In that light, it would seem that the creation of humans or mankind or humankind, however you wish to say it, is the act that completes God's creation. With the creation of men and women in his image, God's creation is completed and or perfected. Perfected not meaning necessarily that all of us are perfect, just that we are created whole. And up until this point, everything else seems to be mundane or ordinary in the Genesis story. But humans were different. Up until this point, God spoke and something came into existence. But Rabbi Rashi wrote, throughout the chapter, Genesis 1, God brought all things into being with an utterance. But he created man with his own hand as it were. In other words, God set humanity apart in the very act of creation to be set apart for and by God. It's the very essence of holiness. After all, that's the real meaning of holiness. It just simply means to be set apart for and by God. So it's no stretch of the imagination to say that in Genesis 1, we see that humanity is created to live holiness in the everyday, to live as people set apart by and for God. We find this truth throughout the scriptures from Genesis to Hebrews to Revelation. Bishop William Willimon in his book Stories by Willimon, isn't that an original title? wrote the heroes of faith, at least among the gallery that appears in chapter 11 of Hebrews, are not so much the martyrs as the perseverers, the Abrahams and the Moseses, who plodded through a wilderness of drab, uneventful, everyday life, with the noonday sun beating down on their backs, but with eyes fixed on God's postponed future. It was not so much a race they ran, as a tedious trek. This cloud of witnesses who trudged ahead of us, whose witness was in their perseverance, now sit in the bleachers, cheering us who come after them. And then he quotes from Hebrews 12, 12 and 13, so strengthen your drooping hands and weak knees. Make straight paths for your feet. So, we discover right here at the beginning of the Bible, and as I said, it's carried on throughout the rest of the scriptures, that we, you and me, were created to live holiness in the everyday, to live as people set apart by and for God. The writer of Hebrews went on to write in Hebrews 12, 14, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Let me suggest that we are intended to be the holiness, the set-apart ones through whom others can see God in the midst of the dailiness of life. Speaking about humanity being cre created in God's image, Rabbi Ramban wrote, Among all living creatures, man alone is endowed like his creator, with morality, reason, and free will. He can know and love God and can hold spiritual communion with him. What this means is that we were created to live holiness in the everyday, but in order to do that, we must feed our spiritual lives. So what do we feed the most? Our physical or our spiritual being. And that even relates to church. We can find many things in church. We can find friendship, a sense of belonging, a sense of purpose, lots of activities to be involved in, and we can even find food downstairs to celebrate Dick's 80th birthday, right? So be sure and stay. That's the only announcement I'm going to give for that. 
But do we find food for our spirits? Alan Smith in Parrots and Priorities told the story of a woman who bought a parrot to keep her company. But she returned it to next, the next day and said, this bird doesn't talk. The owner of the pet store said, does he have a mirror in his cage? Parrots love mirrors. They see their reflection and start a conversation. So the woman bought a mirror and went home. The next day she returned. The bird still wasn't talking. The pet store owner said, how about a ladder? Par parrots love ladders. A happy parrot is a talkative parrot. So the woman bought a ladder and left. But the next day, she was back again. Uh, the owner said, does your parrot have a swing? No? Well, that's the problem. Once he starts swinging, he'll talk up a storm. Well, the woman reluctantly bought a swing and left. And the next day, uh, you're way ahead of me. She returned, but her countenance had changed. The parrot died, she said. The pet store owner was shocked. I'm so sorry. Tell me, did he ever say anything? Yes, she replied, right before he died, in a weak voice, he asked me, don't they sell any food at that pet store? <laughs> she bought everything for the bird except what it needed to survive. We can be so busy doing the work of God that we have no time left to feed our spirits to spend time with God. We can be taking care of every part of our being except our spirits. In Matthew 4, verses 1 through 4, it reads, And Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. If we want to live holiness in the everyday, then we must feed our spirits. And we do that best by maintaining a proper balance in life. Again, quoting from Alan Smith, who told this story, while driving down the road, a motorist saw a roadside stand which had a fortune teller sitting under an umbrella. She was just sitting there smiling and laughing. The motorist passed on by and went a couple of miles on down the road. And all of a sudden, he spun around and sped back toward the fortune teller. As he got closer to the still laughing fortune teller, he began to slow down. He pulled up next to the woman, jumped out of his car, and went over and began slapping and beating her. A policeman passing by screeched to a halt and wrestled the man to the ground. After cuffing the man, he stood him up and asked him, What do you think you're doing? And after a moment, the man replied, Well, I've always wanted to strike a happy medium. Come on, you can groan louder than that. Smith went on to write, one of the keys to successful Christian living is learning to strike a happy medium. No, not hitting a fortune teller, but moderation. Too much of one thing can leave us unbalanced. Too much work results in stress. Too much rest results in laziness. Too much laughter leads to not taking life seriously. Too many tears lead to depression. Too much time with the world causes us to lose our spirituality. Too much time on the mountaintop with God causes us to lose sight of our mission in the world. We struggle with maintaining a proper balance in our lives, seeking to be like Jesus Christ, who modeled that balance and had it all together. End of quote. And that brings us back to Genesis. Remember that I said Nick had chosen Genesis 1.31, but I needed to go back to verse 27 to give it some context. But that's only 
part of the context. To get the rest of the context, we have to go forward into Genesis 2, verses 1 through 3, where it reads, Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Something more was needed after God had created all things and declared that it was very good. It was the Sabbath. The Sabbath is meant to bridge the gap between the mundane, the secular, and the holy. It was only after humans were created that the Sabbath could be introduced. Why is that? Again, I I found this thought from a Jewish rabbi, but I forgot to write down the name or the quote, so you just get what I remember from it. He suggested that the Sabbath needs humans almost as much as humans need the Sabbath. After all, the Sabbath is only a day of the week, just like any other day, unless someone lives it. While God makes the Sabbath holy, sets it apart, we, you and I, human beings, we introduce that holiness into the world by keeping the Sabbath. The Sabbath introduces balance into our lives every week. It's by maintaining this balance that we learn to feed our spirits, which strengthens us to live holiness in the everyday. And Jesus modeled this balance for us. And he invites us to the table of God, not just to receive communion, but the table of God to receive that balance and that wholeness in our lives. And so this day, we remember. We remember what Jesus has done for us. We remember Jesus meeting with his disciples in that upper room as he's preparing to leave them. And as they gathered at table, he took the bread. He gave thanks to God. He broke the bread. And he said to them, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup. And then he said, this is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this as often as you will in remembrance of me. And so we receive the body and the blood of Christ. Let us pray. Lord our God, we pray, pour out your spirit upon us gathered here and upon these elements of bread and juice. Let them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we might be your representatives in our world. Come by your Holy Spirit and meet us here. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord Jesus invites to his table all who will come We as United Methodists invite all who name the name of the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior and who attempt to live at peace with their fellow human beings. We invite you to come and to receive. But just now I'm going to ask those who are participating in serving the communion if they will come.
you to come as Glenda plays this morning to receive the body and the blood of Christ broken and shed. This day, O oh Lord, we thank you for all with which you have blessed us, especially for Jesus who came to show us how to live your life in this world and to offer himself for our sins. 
and to rise from the dead to show us that there is life with you, not just in the world to come, but in this world, that we might live your holiness in our world. We give you thanks. In his name we pray. Amen. Tim 2108, oh how he loves you and me. Please stand as we sing. I told them last night that next Saturday is their best chance to have the largest Saturday night service of the year. All that they had to do was to go out and remind people that Saturday service was at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, and that night everybody has to turn their clocks forward one hour and lose an hour of sleep if they didn't come to Saturday night service. That's just my reminder that next week is daylight saving time, the beginning of it. And I'll preach an extra long sermon so you can catch up on your sleep during worship. Now I'm just teasing about that. Bishop Willimon tells a story about Bishop Tulis, who was speaking to a, a group that included Willimon when he was in seminary. They were about to to be ordained and Bishop Tulis was telling him to be prepared and so he told him the story of a Methodist minister from one of those city churches you know that have the high steeples that raise to the sky and this Methodist minister had gone hunting in Kentucky and he had been out three days hunting away from his car and, and camping out and hunting and after the third day he decided it was time to go back because it was getting dark but he remembered he didn't know where his car was well he meandered about and realized he wasn't getting anywhere it was now dark and what was he going to do he decided if he shot his gun into the air maybe somebody would hear it and find him and so he took out his gun, he fired it into the air, and about that time a, a game warden came out of the bushes and said, you're hunting in the dark, I'm going to give you a ticket for hunting in the dark. And the preacher said, no, I'm a Methodist preacher, I've been hunting for three days, and I got lost, can't find my car, my way out. Well, the game warden looked at him, and he thought, he doesn't look like a Methodist preacher, he doesn't have a collar on, and has a three-day growth of beard, and he's all scruffy. And He said, well, if you're a Methodist preacher, tell me the Lord's Prayer. Well, the preacher got all flabbergasted, and he said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. <laughs> Game warden said, by God, you are a Methodist preacher. <laughs> well, you know, the world isn't waiting to find out if we really know the Lord's Prayer or Psalm 23. They want to see our lives. Do we live the holiness of God, the set-apartness that we say that we are? So this day and this week, let us go. 
let us go and live as people set apart to live God's life in this world. Let us go and live God's message of life, love, and hope for all. Now may the love of the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the peace and the power of the Holy Spirit be evident in our living and in our loving through all eternity.